Okay, welcome everybody. I'm super happy that we have such a large audience for this discussion. Today we are going to have a panel on the colonial design education and this panel will be recorded and then I'm going to publish it as part of a podcast. The podcast is Diseño y Diaspora. So the idea is that we will discuss for around 40 minutes and then you will have some great questions and you will be very attentive to all the things that I forget to ask to these um, ladies and then ask about this. So this podcast is Diseño y Diaspora. I have done it for the last uh, five years and, and it's mainly in Spanish. Uh, sometimes in Portuguese and today in English, because uh, when we are going to talk about the colonial practices, one of the way is also to allow the ones that we have uh, multilingual lives to be able to talk and design in our languages. Um, so this is how I started now, is the most listened podcast in, in the Latin American region. And mostly they are interviews to designers that, uh, that are from the global south and, they are all, uh, and the, whose practices are also the colonial. So here in Finland, the students from the school, from this university, but especially this collective, Sur, <laughs> did I say it right? <laughs> right? Okay, they have realized that there is a lack of discussion in, within this uh, design uh, education about South perspectives and ep epistemologies. So uh, this is why we have this uh, exhibition over there that you are welcome to visit after the after the talk if you are not uh, every day in this school. And also this is why we are all here with these three experts, and um, we have chosen them because they are the ones that are more sensitive to these topics, and they have been thinking about about how to bring the colonial practices to their own uh, teaching and designing. Um, my name is Mariana Salgado, and this is Diseño y Diaspora. So, would you like to present yourselves? Uh, thanks, Mariana, and uh, the people from Sur for the invitation. Uh, my name is Andrea Botero, uh, and I work as Academy oh, so sorry. Finnish Research Council Fellow <laughs> and uh, for some months already as professor here in the in this school in the design department. Thank you. Yes. Welcome, Andrea. Hi. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, sir, for the invitation. My name is Jimena Garifa. Uh, I'm originally from Argentina. I moved to Finland last year. And my role, I am a foresight practitioner, a strategic foresight, and also service designer, so I try to combine both. I work as an independent consultant, mostly now for UN Global Pulse. Well, my meal explain later what's about. <laughs> so Do you yeah. want to explain now what is okay, UN Global Pulse? So we UN know. UN Global Pulse <laughs> is the laboratory of innovation for the Secretary General from the, the United Nations, and I'm in the foresight team there, and we try to experiment to help others, uh, UN agency, found some programs to innovate and reach the acceleration to foster a better future. Can you put your mic yes, a little sorry. bit near? No, no, <laughs> it's fine, but because we are recording, sorry, I need sorry. to remind sometimes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mariana. And uh, thank you, Sofia and Amy and El Colectivo Sur for this really wonderful invitation. I'm delighted to be here for many reasons, that especially to see this uh, really nice uh, panel that we have met uh, so many years ago and we never thought we will be able to be here after so many years. So uh, mm -hmm. that is one of the first uh, really nice thing of decolonial uh, practice in practice. I think this is a, a big step uh, as a female Latin Americanist uh, uh, working in Finland as well. And uh, my name is Florencia Quesada Vendaño. I am a associate professor of Latin American studies at the University of Helsinki. I'm a historian by training 
but I have been moving out from my comfort zone many times <laughs> and <laughs> doing as well research in social sciences. And uh, the Latin American city has been like the main topic of my research, both in historical and uh, contemporary terms about different uh, issues of cultural history of, of uh, Latin America and especially Central America. Uh, I am a Costa Rican originally <laughs> and always, <laughs> certainly, but, uh, and I, uh, I, my field of, uh, or my region of uh, specialization is Central America, which is uh, a very peripheral <laughs> uh, region from the, in Latin America. We tend to say uh, uh, that it's uh, South America starts in Mexico and goes all the way down for many people, not we, but for many people mentally, that's how it is uh, the region conceived. But no, uh, Mexico is part of, of North America, and uh, then, then there is a Central American region, and then South America. So I've been in, in this long uh, process of decolonization as well, of, uh, or, vis, or, or putting in the center of a research topic, uh, Central America. But I, I really want to thank you for this invitation. Sorry I talked too much. And I no, don't worry. Too long. We all talk too much, and I really hope that we interrupt each other, right? We yeah. are four Latin Americans, and this means no for shame, us... No shame, no shame. <laughs> if we interrupt, it means that we are super motivated and we are eager to, yeah. to um, say what we are thinking. And that includes shamelessly asking people to sit in the front. Yeah. Yeah, including Andrea's aunt. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so always I like to start with a concrete project. So I'm going to ask you a, a concrete activity that you have uh, done in connection to these decolonial practices. What would you choose? Because I know that you all are doing a lot of things. So please, one. <laughs> So I live many years in Argentina, so I have a lot of projects to share, but I will choose only one because of time. <laughs> and this project is one I, I developed in, with UN Global Pulse. Uh, it was carried out in Colombia last year, as it started last year, it's continued now. And we developed it in two regions, in Chocó and Amazonas. The idea was to involve citizens, usually left behind or underrepresented communities, to understand what are their future visions and help then the government to uh, develop better policy uh, making. So we carry out this project we, together with another UN agency, that is UNFPA, is the Population Fund Agency, and also together with the National Development Planning Office from the Colombian government. Um, here, maybe just to introduce what did we do. We understand design, or I may understand design, as deciding with an intention. When we talk about deciding, we talk about having at least two options. So having, exploring a lot of diversity possibilities. And when we talk about intention, is why. Why are we doing what we are doing? And so then we can define the what, the who, the for whom, the where. And in this process, in this project, we try to really intentionally design all end-to-end. -end. So where is, uh, for example, from the most abroad, is like what method are we following to achieve this goal? Then what tools are we using? Uh, with which people are we developing this? For whom? Who is our But did you know what you wanted to design? <laughs> yeah, we have developed it in, in many. It was like a three weeks most uh, important of developing the process on what do we want to do, and then we carry out an experiment in the field. And we invited young designers, yeah, sorry, no, uh, youth leaders, young leaders from the region, from these communities, to bring them with us to, uh, no, to bring them, but to help us design uh, these activities so we can be culturally appropriate, so we can really engage with the communities, and also to understand like, if the language, the rituals, or all the setup is appropriate for them to really engage and participate in these uh, community ambitions and future design, bringing what they really want to say, like building a safe space for them to contribute and share their, their learnings, their experience. 
So after we made these two experiments, they're in the field, and they now just added foresight as a policy making tool to continue uh, make these consultations with citizens. And we are about to launch a toolkit with all the step by step of what are what have we done to help uh, bring these community voices out loud. So sorry, I have to ask you, but why do you think this has been in within the framework of decolonial design? That's a good question. <laughs> we when we say about it, we intentionally design everything. We say, okay, for whom are we designing this? Who do we want to bring to be not benefit but enrich with this uh, with this experience? Also, with whom? So that's we bring this young leader to have this intergenerational dia dialogues and also like different uh, communities co-creating this project, not only be, being consulted, but also being co-creating with us how it's gonna be developed. And we talk about uh, inclusion of different audiences. In this workshop, we invited, we asked these young leaders like, okay, if we are going to assign the future of your community, who do you think should have a voice here? Who should we invite to consider their thinking their way of, of living. So in all the stages, we try to be inclusive, we try to be accessible, we try to be collaborating in all our practices and many other factors. So how did you, because I understood that you went there with some ideas and then not all of them um, happened as you wanted, right? So in a way, partly of what this um, was decolonial was also that you were very permeate or, or that you were very open to what was going on there. <laughs> could you tell us one story about uh, that could depict better what, how it was decolonial? <laughs> uh, I think something that really shocked me was about the timing. I'm from Buenos Aires, so this uh, city that is always running. So being there, I prepared from like here with a draft of an agenda, what, what was I imagining, just to not be there with a blank page. And when I arrived, it was like, no, no, no. The first day will be only a ritual to engage with the community, to understand the way of living, and only that. And the second day, we have only two hours in the morning, then people should relax, then we need to engage, and all of these uh, specific things of how the community is behaving. What are the, for example, I don't know, the place we choose to do this workshop was an open space with a lot of plants. The food was fruit, super simple, but is what they are, in which space are they comfortable with, what is a safe space for them? So we should adapt to their, to their practices and not they to us. And so you have one day only devoted to uh, get to know each other. Yes, and, it and was that was key because then all yeah. the other practices just were super smooth. We have trust. Uh, people were able to share things that, if not, I don't think they whole they whole have shared them, like personal things. And that's really the point. If you are there in the field, just listen, step back, and you should be part of them. I mean, we learned a lot from them. Thank you. Great case. Now we can go to the education part, right? Because we have here no. two educators. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I thought that we were not going to discuss as well the uh, sure. examples of research. Uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I think it's important. Well, I'm a, mainly a research and researcher, and and uh, I I have applied in many different way, ways for a long time, even. When this whole decolonial uh, fashion uh, uh, fast word that, of course, everybody is talking about decoloniality nowadays, and but I think we have been doing a lot of efforts already for a long time on towards this uh, decolonization. And in my case, as a historian, I've been doing urban cultural history of of Central American cities, and it, it is a field that has not been developed much. And of course, it's always the paradigm 
is in, in the centers of modernity, which are Paris, uh, London, and, and the main uh, Vienna, the main uh, European cities, or in the United States. But for years, I, I was very uncomfortable with this paradigm, but without having the theoretical tools to find a different way to do my research. And it was, uh, I've been attempting to understand what uh, Angel Rama was saying, that to understand what is that, the, the, that local nature that uh, was the spark that of, of change in Latin American cities at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, the first modernity, which is a really important period in the development of cities in Latin America because it determined how the cities throughout the 20th century Group, but we don't know that much of that period of where uh, the roots of that uh, city of the 20th century. So, in the case of Guatemala City, I have been spending a lot of time in the archives as a historian. That is one of the most difficult things, and trying to have a different theoretical approach. That thanks to Jennifer Robinson, finally I, I was able to have more theoretical tools of that cases of ordinary cities such as uh, Guatemala City, a peripheral city from the periphery. <laughs> and But uh, one of the approaches she is uh, implying in this decolonial turn is that not to think that there are centers of modernity based in Europe, but that all the cities are equal. And it's not this idea of progressive uh, modernity that all the cities have to follow. So that there's a local thing that we have to understand and unveil in by, by only, and the only th th way of doing that is by doing research and going to the sources. But that takes a lot of time. And yeah, it's been a, a long process and that's uh, what I'm doing at the moment, writing a book about uh, Guatemala City and this process of, of urban change. I have another project that I will start working, but maybe I will leave it for later because I've talked That's already too much. That's a good case. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to first make a disclaimer, and it was something that I, I talked with Sophia when we, when we first thought about the panelists. I personally uh, have not used the term decolonial in mm. my work mm. because I and I don't think I have ever written that on a paper or done something with that. So I would like to first say that I, because I want to be humble <laughs> in the sense that I do not want to appropriate that struggle when I'm not doing the work it requires at the level I think it requires. So this would be my first disclaimer. I do not believe I have anything. I, I think there will be probably a paper next year where I am the last author and the first, the, the first authors, they, they are putting their muscles uh, there and, and have been thinking about this before. Having said that, of course, I have read some of the canonical texts uh, <laughs> about that, because if we think about the coloniality, most of them are Latin Americans. And, and then there's all kinds of terms. You know, you have post-colonial, decolonial, anti-colonial, whatever, this and that, uh, 25 more. So some of the people that have been putting a lot of thought to this idea of having to unlearn coloniality are Latin Americans. So I have read them. Uh, and I've learned a lot for them, but I cannot claim I'm doing that. So that would be the disclaimer. Having said what I'm interested in, of course, it's uh, uh, this idea of unlearning my, the way I have been encultured into a particular way of design that the decolonials have taught me has to do uh, very much with the modern uh, idea of progress that unfortunately has brought us <laughs> some of the challenges uh, we have now. So I'm trying to uh, actively unlearn uh, this idea that there is only one way of planning, uh, prefiguring, uh, thinking about the material world and the future, which was taught to me was the Bauhaus idea, or actually my professors, I think, have been all trained in the Ulm uh, school, uh, not on the Bauhaus. So it was this um, 
Um, this this idea of form giving and certain kind of iteration and certain kind of understanding of of the role of the designer and form giving in these processes that this is the way that the world is created everywhere. <laughs> Uh, even when I was in Bogota, in Colombia, a, seat, a country which had a different kind of industrialization uh, uh, process. So I would be working for other kinds of things that do not look like the industries of Britain. <laughs> so it was different. So I, I am now on learning that. We, in my example is... Uh, lately, I have been working. Wait, wait a minute. Yes. One one thing I want to yeah. put it clear. Maybe it's not enough clear for me, but for you, uh, because a lot of your your research and your design practice connect to Latin American geographies, if I understand it yeah, right. Yeah, but I could do the colonial. I guess I but could do that. Not necessarily context, yes. means that the fact that is Latin American does not also necessarily mean means it's that is the colonial. Yes. yes, that is that. This is, is the point. That is yeah. that is <laughs> that is. Uh, I think the first thing to understand it is not because I happen to have born in Colombia. I'm automatically somehow. <laughs> doing the colonial stuff that cannot that's that's not uh, possible so, no and you have been am, the last 25 years yes, in finland in right? finland so yeah <laughs> that even complicates it uh, uh, <laughs> even more uh, but but there are but two very fairies so, so that's also interesting my so my case so uh, uh from from uh some years uh now i have been working with a friend who also studied design um same university as me, uh, but she is uh, from the south of Colombia, from a community called Kamsa. Uh, Alexandra uh, had studied and came back to her community. Um, they are famous weavers. This is in the south of Colombia, uh, in what was the outskirts of the Inca Empire. And I don't know how you're familiar you are with the South American uh, history, but the Incas used to run their empire on textile technologies. Textiles were the place where they uh, keep the record of their taxes, tell their stories, grab their children. We know very little uh, about the, the kinds of technologies through which they created that empire because there were lots of textiles and textiles don't last very long, they, they decay. But uh, in the community where Alexandra lives, uh, they still weave um, a little sash. Uh, women uh, wrap themselves um, when they are pregnant, when they have their periods, um, a menopause, when their children are born, they wrap them in these uh, things. Uh, it is one of those remnants of a large infrastructure, textile infrastructure, that still to today uh, is being weaved. Uh, it's been weaved to uh, both account for history, memory, and uh, understanding of the, of the territory in ways that, in my mind, fulfill some of the roles that design fulfills here. But differently. So it's not the same. So uh, with them and with a group of viewers, we've been trying to understand what it is this... Uh, well, they know it. I don't know it. So that's what I'm trying to understand or to learn with them. What it is that making the world through that practice uh, means. And there's more to tell, but for now we can leave it at that. Okay, but yes. uh, you can tell more if you want, because the next question is about design and yeah. education, and especially the colonial education. So if you want yes. to tell something more about that, <laughs> you are, I mean, in which way do you think this relates mm. to the colonial practices? Ah, well, uh, so far, <laughs> this stuff that I have been doing uh, hasn't permeated so much my teaching, mostly because I haven't been teaching very much lately, but I'm doing it now uh, a little bit more. And uh, this idea of unlearning this one way of design, only one way of design to think about other ways, includes uh, ideas about, for example, 
in the course I am uh, teaching now, uh, besides a learning diary, <laughs> that's like, you know, writing. I've given my students a yarn, a wool, <laughs> uh, which I myself have uh, assembled. And I've asked to make the learning diaries with knots. And then we have been thinking about what it takes to reflect uh, with knotting. Like the kipus. Yes. Yeah. That's one of the references I give them, but they also give them this. What is other the kipus? One. Sorry, I didn't understand that. This is, the kipus are this Inca technology to keep records, not... Of they, everything. Uh, they, yeah. they, 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 they did. So this is one, but you know that there's other kinds of, of things that we'll see. So it is not necessarily because it's the Incas, but it's just because I'm interested in all us together exploring different ways of reflecting that are not only uh, verbal or visual, but that might be more tactile, for example, because it just generates a different kind of discussion in class. Did it? Yes, it does. Yeah. In which way was different the discussion? Uh, because, <laughs> because the act of making a knot and then going through the knot involves your hand, uh, your touch, your smell. So they tend to think about different things or record different things that are not only, oh, we saw this or that, but they, ha they relate more, a little bit more with uh, feelings. That is something that comes a lot in, in the class, so like a, that involve their body and not only their mind. Their mind. Perfect. So we, we now listen a little bit about these um, approaches to the colonial education. Yeah. How these uh, approaches have to do with your uh, work? Yeah, I think it's a really important uh, question. And of course, at uh, the university level here and the University of Helsinki and elsewhere in Finland, I think, and many other parts of the world, we based our teaching on research. That is a really fundamental, uh, basic uh, thing. And that's why we have to keep on doing research in order to put in practice this knowledge we can produce about these decolonial practices that we might want to tell nowadays. But for example, I, I'll give um, a specific thing. I've been teaching a lot. I have to teach a lot in this position. So I have to uh, create new courses all the time. and. One of the ways that I've been trying to decolonize the knowledge is like bringing up the knowledge produced in Latin America, just to be a, a little bit more specific, because in this uh, uh, Euro or North-centric world of uh, publication in uh, specialized journals and in this competitive nonsense uh, academic life that we have to follow, uh, or we should not be following, but Fortunately, these are the, the, the mainstream rules. Everything comes from these basic uh, spaces of, of knowledge, of power, of those people who can have the uh, resources to publish in these very expensive uh, journals. But the great majority of, of great academics in the Global South, they don't have those resources, for example, and they produce a lot of, of good uh, knowledge as well. But this has been completely ignored because um, it might not be in English. In my case, I have the, the possibility to give some uh, texts in Spanish, and that allows me to open up that window of possibilities. For example, in Central America, one of actually one of my old uh, uh, professors of history from Costa Rica, they have uh, been producing a great, uh, uh, amazing podcast about the history of Central America. And uh, it's rare, because Central America is a very poor region. There are not many good universities of quality. So this podcast means a lot for the popular knowledge of history that it's always reflect in the present days. And so I've been like doing the exercise with the students that they have to hear the podcasts and try to bring another point of view. To, to the history and the present day. And they, they give voices to young activists, female actors. Uh, so many, there's a process of decolonization in the making of those podcasts as well. And so I think that is like a concrete way. Of course, I can talk about 
other, other ways of doing. But of course, if you start a new project, like we are now planning a new project, we haven't submitted yet, but it's about public space in Latin America as well. It's, it's a crucial topic because it has been, there has been a process of privatization of the public space through the neoliberal city in a very aggressive way, especially in the, in the past uh, 25 years. And uh, we are trying to understand through this whole uh, process of the turning down of monuments, this decolonization of the public space in, in Latin America. So we are trying to now do a project about this that we are designing as well, a course that it's going to be part of the curricula based on this knowledge that hopefully we get money <laughs> to produce it and to have a concrete action of, from research to uh, education. And I think that that's the way it should, it should go based on research and, and on urgent issues that we have to understand. And, and, and this is a project that is not only related to Latin America, but it's a global or we are aiming to have like a global interdisciplinary networks of scholars working in the global south and in the global north uh, towards this really interesting topic that we 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 talk a lot, but uh, not that much research in comparative terms in a global perspective. Uh, there are not that many projects like that. So now one question to Jimena, because the, the last one was not for you. So uh, in your professional work uh, in the strategic uh, foresight team, do you use um, or incorporate this South perspective or epistemologies in certain ways? Because you told us something that you, um, it was very kind of um, the work that you do when you go to the field, right? But you can also do it for the work that you do uh, more theoretical also, <laughs> I guess. I think that the South perspectives are like intrinsic in everything I do because I cannot live without that. But when we talk about methods and tools and how do we carry this to the real practice, for example, after living many years in Argentina, I found uh, always surrounded by this constant uncertainty and chaos and complexity and things changing all the time. So living in that context maybe think about, okay, what is happening here? Like the people is uh, making some solidarity actions to help each other and empower their own communities, their neighbors, to bring up these uh, common needs and help each other. So after understanding now that where is the, the power there, the power of change, I developed some foresight tools and method tools to bring and open these, these methods to more, so more people can start intentionally designing their futures. So we develop an open book with a step-by-step -step methodology so more people can bring to this and make a structure design with some intention, some goal, and how to help them to be with a specific output. Then other thing I have developed is a framework that is called Identify, Involve, and Immerse, are three stages on how do we uh, engage with other actors, other people, when we are designing, in this case it was a foresight process, but I think it can apply to any design process or any process, is how to not be extractive when we involve people in, in a project, not to ask and just benefit from them, but how to co-create and collaborate and have a win-win situation where both learn and can just build a better world. And the third thing is a, a project that Claudia Sensulueta, that is there, is designing, is, is called Our Future Cards, Future Cards. And it's a set of cards with what-if prompts and how good you like ideas on how to start uh, bringing more decolonizing methods and tools and skills to any project we carry out. So maybe she can explain later a bit. Yes, sure. You will be invited. So I promised uh, only that we are going to discuss for 40 minutes. So my last, questions to, uh, my last question to you is like, uh, how do you see the colonial practices and education in the future? And how do we go toward like a more utopical situation? Who do wants to start? Andrea, uh, Florencia is ready. <laughs> Florencia was having a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, one of the things I'm so grateful about this uh, possibility is that nevertheless, we live in the same uh, 
well, almost the same cities, the great uh, metropolitan area of Helsinki, is that we need more bridges of collaboration between the University of Helsinki and Aalto University. And I think this is going to be the first step, I hope, of collaboration in, in many senses. But we never had the possibility or the platform even to sit and discuss together. And this, uh, I, th I thank you for, for this opportunity, and I'm really happy for that. And I think we can, uh, there are many possibilities of collaboration, of uh, whatever you want to call it, co-production, decolonizing, <laughs> whatever, of uh, together towards uh, a big agenda of, of issues that we can uh, uh, build uh, bridges and, and the understanding an interdisciplinary way, which is another of the basic things of doing research nowadays, and uh, facing all these uh, urgent uh, dilemmas of climate change and inequalities, which are the main topics uh, that we are uh, uh, suffering and dealing with. And I think we can and we must do more collaboration together in, towards these uh, goals uh, together. So and I'm really happy and and here eager we to We are starting work with together. that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, so the future I, I guess that first it is um, not an easy task because there are many things which have kind of the weight of the <laughs> the inertia of how things have been doing forever. So it is sometimes it takes time and energy. To Sometimes change. you don't have the time or the energy to try to steer the things. Uh, but I think there's also hope and I see there's uh, most of it, there's hope because it is a theme that you see resonates with the people that are starting to study now in the university. They come already here with, with those questions. It's not something that necessarily we are providing. It is something they are coming already with. Like, like like this initiative like, that came like from them. the students, right? <laughs> like them. Uh, so I, I don't think that, and I'm including myself, you know, as part of the furniture already because I've been some years uh, here. It's not something that that we might be able to do, but it is something that will will come uh, because because the students and their, their new waves they they are coming with that interest, and then they will force the the place uh, to change eventually mm. yeah or open up for different different ways of doing things which is i guess the main the main point at least uh, from from up north yeah. and apparently uh, there is room and space for designers that are involved in the colonial practices so what would you say Jimena? yes i totally agree with both of you uh, i think there, I, I am optimistic about the future. I think uh, new generations, younger generations, are like inclusion and diversity is non-negotiable. They are this uh, bottom-up uh, arguing and questioning and reflecting and thinking about how to behave and how to respect our cultures in mostly cases. I know it's, it's, not, the, it's not general, but I don't know if maybe it's this interconnection in the world that we really know how others live and behave and we can learn from other cultures totally away, like in distance, but we can feel like this, this connection is happening. And I think that some ideas on how to start and what to do, just asking yourself what you are doing, who are you including, why, why are you researching when you research, are you asking the same questions to the same people, or, or looking at the same sources, or are you involving other authors, other practices, other tools? Um, also, like having these safe spaces, like communities of practice, where people on the same level can learn from each other and start charging, trying to learn from what we have around, instead of always looking above, we can look uh, at the, on the right or the left. And of course, more of these sur events or collaboration on, on these practices are really enriching our our learnings and studies. Who do we learn from, and then how do we repeat that? And I, yes. I want to add something that uh, that to say that it's already uh, some collaboration started already some years ago in many different ways. And there is one of my projects that I, I worked some years ago in Guatemala City in, in the informal settlements uh, was born thanks 
from the collaboration and co-production and co-creation and co-support that I had with uh, Andrea Valladares and Onise Arango. Andrea Valladares, was, uh, she was graduated from the master's uh, degree in Alto in design. And we did this project together in uh, one of the uh, most uh, difficult areas because of violence and because of poverty and many other things related. And we did a very uh, successful collaborative uh, project. So it's not that it hasn't been done. And as well with Claudia Garduño, I have been uh, collaborating as well. And we actually uh, organized through UNIPIT some years ago uh, a round table in, in, in a Congress uh, talking about these experiences of co-creation and collaboration between Finland and uh, Latin America in the cases of Guatemala and Mexico. So there are many projects that have been going on and many others in Africa and in other places. But I'm just talking specifically that now us in these positions, of course, we can do uh, many interesting things. And all the people that she was mentioning, you can't listen to them in interviews in the podcast. <laughs> so what we are talking about, uh, the colonial design education, I wanted to just make the point that is there is some education that happens in these institutions, but there is other educations, the informal education that happened with this actualization or this like listening to podcasts, listening to what is going on uh, in other formats, in other spaces that are not necessarily the, the institutions. No, there is many other ways in we educate ourselves. So being said, so now I would like to give the mic to the collective Sur, <laughs> the Sur Collective, because I guess there is a lot of things that you want to ask. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, we're so happy, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much for this discussion. It's so interesting for us. And I mean... Ah, okay, yes, now. Okay. <laughs> Near. And I mean, I think when we started the collective, we thought, okay, we want this, who do we have to talk to? And then we got to know about your work and we were super inspired by what you were doing already. So for us, it's, it's an honor. <laughs> that, that, and, and also it feels like when we talk about the colonial and also this kind of hierarchies and things, as soon as we approach you all, it feels so natural and so open and Mariana also, when we met you, was like right away, like sharing knowledge, sharing our experiences, and not just from this, like, I know more than you, but also from this human experience of being Latins in Finland. And for us, it's been like amazing that knowledge is not just about, yeah, like how we do things more efficient, but it's also about our experiences. So this is a very nice space to share this. So. Uh, and now questions. Questions, questions. Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, do you want to start? Yeah, I have so many. Can but you present yourself? Just the name at least. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm Amy. I am uh, part of the collective as well. And uh, I'm originally from Guatemala City. So we have talked a lot with Florencia. And I've been really interested in her research as well. But one of the um, questions that at least have been perhaps from a, from a more concrete point, because we've been seeing this gap in the education here in Aldo, that there might be more active actors in the University of Helsinki, or at least when uh, we have engaged with activist groups, a lot of them come from the University of Helsinki. And, in, and even when we say like, oh, we are a SUR, a decolonizing collective based in Aalto, they go like, Aalto, like what? No, like no way. Like it it's a, <laughs> yeah, it can't be. Like there is this very strong image about how technocratic the university is. So. In more concrete terms, I would like to hear from you because, I mean, we have many ideas about what a possible collaboration could look like. For example, the starting point being something like this or a project that you're doing with other researchers between schools. But I would like to hear, for example, um, for, for example from Andrea, if you, you have been here for some years in the university. So what do you think we could benefit the most from the University of Helsinki if we look at it from, from Aalto? Uh, well, I guess the history, the way the university education in Finland was born had, you know, it, it then results in this package that you have a lot of the humanities and the, and the social kind of 
of work, which is usually associated with a little bit more like critical thinking, probably, uh, being kind of more siloed there. And then, you know, the more kind of pragmatic uh, engineering, getting things done uh, kind of thing in, in, in a place like here, um, you know, create, creates <laughs> certain burdens we have to live uh, uh, with now. Uh, but I think that the fact that uh, a, a school like us exists within Alto, uh, I hope, creates the space for that, because I think that anyway, arts or creative practice trouble some of the basic uh, principles of, of uh, making things that work. So I think that it depends on us, but I'm to be sure, I'm not exactly <laughs> myself uh, very very sure how to how to go about it. But I always believe that that we cannot wait till the official channels make make the <laughs> make the things happen, and and we should take more the more our students could take more courses uh, uh, over there, and we should you know like if if the course is not there, we can organize the reading circle and uh, you know like all these kinds of, of of things until you know there's noise enough critical mass do you want to add something Claudia? yes sure uh i think there's a concrete way of that we can use that channel and start infiltrating through there it's the program the master's program of urban studies and planning which is already a joint program between the university of helsinki and alto uh, uh, university sorry and uh, i i am involved in the steering committee of this uh, uh, of this uh, master's program and i'm i'm also uh, lecturing there and there is a lack of courses about the Global South, the students are claiming for more mm -hmm. of this type of uh, uh, courses and experience and, and specialists yeah. from the Global South. And I think we can start offering, there's the platform there, or I don't know how associated you are with urban studies and planning or how it works that here, yeah, but let's not enter into the specifics. Okay, yeah. it's fine. This we yeah, can yeah. we can do it in a meeting. I think yeah. here we are yeah. for having a conversation sure. well, on the strategic and where do we go to? Where do we want to go? In short, and, we yeah. can have like a joint uh, <laughs> course about spatial justice, about uh, I mean hundreds of different courses that are needed that students are asking for, and that it's already there. So that's something easy, uh, or in a way that we can start maybe planning something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you so much for the conversation. Please put the mic uh, near. Thank you. Right <laughs> next to me then. OK. <laughs> Perfect. So I have a question about knowledge exchange in research, design practices, and also in educational practices. How does it work in, in practice, like learning from others, but also giving back and vice versa, going down, humbling down, and also this reciprocity in knowledge, basically. In, I, I'm interested also how has it been in, not only in theory, but also in your practical work, in education, in research, in design. Actually, this question is for each of you <laughs> for that, because I'm really curious, for example, how, what happened with cancer people and et cetera. This is a, a, a fascinating question because, of course, I always have the feeling that I have learned more from <laughs> from from my uh, engagement with Alexandra, Susanna and, and Eliana and the weavers. And then I've humble attempt to try to balance <laughs> balance that that uh, those kinds of disparity disparities are both pragmatic and also a little bit let's say more abstract pragmatic I mean that uh, I've used uh, travel budgets and uh, um, per diems and all kinds of things every possible way that I can scrap out of the funding to fund work in there so it's not mine, but it, it funds their work. So I have many works around, <laughs> try to, try to uh, concretely divert my funds towards there. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, authorship order, and, and I'm being very concrete, authorship order. Our decision is that every single paper that we are writing, the first version is written either in Kamsa or in Spanish, 
and the first authors are there. They are there. For, even if they have not had the time to write, even if it's Eliana, which is my colleague in Bogota, or myself, who uh, have been doing the labor of putting the words together, but of course, based on the work we've done together, and they, they don't necessarily have the time to sit and <laughs> write, but they are the first authors. And this is a collective decision we have made. If we, have, if we are doing something, the first choice is anything that we do together, it is first shown in Segundoy, always. So now, by the way, they are going to have an exhibition here, but it was last week in Sigundo about no, it's the... the in, it's going to be it, in Sigundo next uh, yeah. weekend, yeah. Yeah, yeah the and the then it's coming to Alto. Yeah, so, so and this <laughs> is the, 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 the pragmatic things, that are those agreements we have done when we have uh, started working together. And then there are other, other ones um, which relate to uh, extending the networks that and the privilege that because we are based on a university, we have certain ones, uh, how, how we deal with them so that we can extend uh, as much as possible uh, to them. So if, if, if I'm invited to talk about it, I always asked Alexandra and Susanna, can you go <laughs> instead of me? So if, 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 if it's not possible for them, then the last resort is that I will talk about it. But no, this is the, the ways I'm trying now practically to do it and not just say, oh, well, we'll do this and that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's a really important question. And um, it really varies on the project you are doing. So it's, for example, in the case of, of all the production I've done in urban history, it's I've been very active as well with the activists of uh, in, in urban terms in my hometown town, uh, San Jose, and I've been uh, helping them, supporting them with my own research, giving uh, talks. In, in that case, I've done that work alone, so I don't, I haven't worked with a team of, of, of people, and I'm always available for them, and I have been supporting them for especially one of the collectives that they are trying to regain the public spaces in, in San Jose, and then they do tour guides through the historical uh, zones, and uh, I've been supporting them for the, the past 15 years with, with, my, with my knowledge, which is the thing I can give uh, the most, and in, in specific activities as well, and always promoting uh, their work in, in other in other senses, in other projects that I I also did a a project about sustainable tourism in the Caribbean side of of Costa Rica as well, and and there it is um, of course uh, most of the things because I'm I'm mainly a researcher or have been I've been trying to be some sort of activist in certain things but I'm mainly a researcher and. And that demands a lot of work, and I'm teaching all the time. So it's try to always have this uh, knowledge that you produce on open access and always available for them, and that whatever you have produced, then it goes back to the, to the community once you have finished, and try to spread uh, that knowledge uh, through that. And then uh, and now, uh, of course, it's a matter of resources as well. But now we are trying to plan to go back there to the community and have like some sort of interdisciplinary and cooperation with the University of Costa Rica and the University of Finland or of Helsinki and do some cooperative work that will benefit the, the, the community. So that is something that it doesn't end with, with a project for a certain amount of years, but then you try to continue to be engaged with the needs and, and, uh, and the problems of, of those communities because you always uh, left a part of you in, in those uh, processes, but of course uh, you have very utopic uh, ideas always and they never materialize or it's not that easy to materialize all those uh, hopes. So it really depends. And in the last uh, project I did about urban violence in, in Guatemala City, that was a more com complicated case because it's very sensitive area, very sensitive topics. And then uh, I have to say I felt uh, very depressed in the sense that I didn't give back much to the whole community, that it's completely dismantled in the, in the whole community's communal sense because of violence and, and the high price they have paid. 
because of being in the center of a long-term uh, conflict. So, well, that, in, it, there is a limitation of what a researcher can do in that context. Sure, hmm? sure. That's why I'm saying that. I mean, I can be very <laughs> idealistic, but then there are practical things that you can simply not change. I cannot change the, the system in Guatemala. Thank you, Jimena. Uh, yes. So from design, and here maybe my survey design hat is the one that fits better. And what we do is trying to design the invisible, being supportive with what people need to do the task they need to do. So if you see, for example, coming back to the same example, the Intelligent the Futuros, Waving Futures, this project we made, if you look now at the documentary, at the photos, are the medium press, everything, my name is nowhere, my face is nowhere. Because, and that's intentional. Because we were there as the mosquitoes, trying to see like, hey, what they are needing. Of course, a lot of preparation beforehand. So we prepare the young leaders to be them, the ones that were going to train their communities to facilitate activities, to present the objectives, to be the, the host of the sessions. And then during the event, we were just there trying to, okay, what they are support, what they are needing now, how can we support them? And after these uh, egg workshops, we are with them designing these tools in order to uh, help their communities and the broader community of people with no expertise at all on how to continue with this type of uh, approaches to help other people and scale this uh, impact to really start being intentional in our futures. So we just, they are trying to step by step in all the stages of the involvement, uh, how to support others to be the best of them. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have another question. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a question, but uh, more like a comment to discuss between like everyone. <laughs> um, I was listening to what Amy was saying about like, yeah, going to the University of Helsinki and kind of like seeing uh, what they do there. I was in that position myself when I started the master's stu the studies like 13 years ago. Um, I was so in love with University of Helsinki and I took some courses there because I wanted to have this critical thinking about the world and everything. And then what I realized it, is that sometimes you don't see what is happening around you because you are looking outside uh, everything else. Of course, I'm saying that we have to learn from each other. But my point is that if we want the colonial kind of education to happen, I think the most important part is to organize ourselves and to start this, um, to agitate the structures in that sense, uh, and start like organizing is so hard, like really, really. I'm, I'm, I, I form part of an organization in, in Mexico. Well, it's like a Latin American organization and we try to organize ourselves in the territory within our assemblies in Latin America. And it's so hard. I think that's the most important part of this, like what kind of education, decolonial education or education or alternative education, education we want. And if we want to think about that, we have to organize these kinds of sessions to think about that together. And it doesn't matter if it's like, um, if we don't have the words in terms of social sciences to say that. If we know what the problems are and if we can kind of like feel them, write them, see them, having them in a podcast, then I think that's, that's kind of like crucial. And the other point is that we should also, within the university, see like what are we, or ask ourselves, what are we producing and for whom? Because sometimes these things or the knowledge that we are pro uh, producing, all the materials we are producing, it's really hard to find ways to kind of like take them outside. And I think I, I love you guys because <laughs> you are doing exactly like those kinds of things. Taking things out of the university is a really important point, a really important part. And that's it. Uh, maybe my comment, I was, it was just to agitate, <laughs> agitate, organize and, and, and 
that was Brenda Bertis talking for the recording. <laughs> 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 who wants to, who, who, it's... Um, Maybe just to kind of continue because, thank you, Brenda, I think that's kind of our spirit and what we want to do. Of course, we were a bit like, are we being too upfront, too political? Like, since we started in uni, is the fr like, I, we have not seen so many exhibitions that have also a political tone in Alto. So we're a bit scared at the beginning. So for us, it's amazing to also have the support of all of you to do these kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> and then we are here to, for you. <laughs> it's, it's okay, it's okay. But then, of course, uh, we, we aim to kind of, because, of course, we were like, okay, but who's talking about this, these topics? And that's why we did the whole work of reading so many thesis works and PhDs and talking with Andrea and, and with Marianne and like, to, to see what was going on. But now we're like, okay, now we want this kind of thing to keep growing. And what we were aiming to or like what we would like to have is a bit like to have this voice that can actually reply to stuff that are happening in Alto. Because we think sometimes in, in well, we are from Alto, so of course we know the experience here, but then sometimes in classes or Alto communities, Alto Instagram or whatever, they say things, but there is never a voice asking like, what? <laughs> and then sometimes the what is really necessary. And we, we were in those situations that maybe we're the only person in a room of 100 people that were really like, maybe just to mention a specific case, uh, but then being in a course talking about wood production and then a happy, like a happy Finnish company talking on how they are making huge factories in Uruguay and they're so proud of it. And I was like, okay, but this is so complicated. But I was the only voice in that whole class that could say something and that could make the questions. And of course, when you're the only one in a group of a lot of Finnish people, also you get a bit shy. So I think my point with this is to see like, how you maybe can see it, how we can keep growing with this and kind of get forces together in a bit and then how to can organize ourselves within the institutions. Uh, now we are, we are working for Alto. We are not student, well, I'm a PhD student, but we are staff. And then how to keep involving students and give students more power also to create these spaces of like, if someone listens to this in a class, they know there will be more people to talk about it and discuss this issue with the teachers or the presentations or like the co Finnish companies talking in our classes. But yeah, so maybe, maybe for you also from Brenda, like how do you see how this can grow? And, and how do you see this energy to keep kind of moving things? Or do you think we have not seen so much resistance yet? But we don't know if it will happen or not, actually. Maybe not. Um, I don't know. The Finns might, might tell otherwise. Uh, is, is, will the Finns resist? I don't know. <laughs> this is such a consensus-building society. that <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but I think that what, what can we do? Uh, more than, like, more, more. Of this, <laughs> yeah. maybe we can. Way. Yeah, maybe we can kind of reply to this question. All of us, not necessarily them, right? Yeah. So you might reply with one word, or you might reply with a sentence. But I would like to hear more the whole audience. Yes, my first courageous one. <laughs> you can pass it around because. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I myself feel like. Finnish people can be quite apathetic to colonialist issues because of like ignorance and then unwillingness to kind of see what Finland itself does because Finland is kind of really branded uh, as a good guy in the world. So it's all it's very difficult for Finnish people to kind of understand that no one is perfect, <laughs> not even Finland. So, Can I ask the Sami? Yes, yeah, uh, yes, I was uh, going to comment on that. Yes, that. That is like the Sami, Sami uh, people, like has been really like in the news, at least in my circles, also like in Norway. Yeah, and there is this uh, new movie I went to see yesterday, She Vida, and it's about how uh, how the Finnish education has been treating Sami people. I recommend you to see it. It's super good. Yes, so so I'm completely Finnish, and I would have to say that like I have only in my like adult year, year years learned about Sami people like 
really like about uh, their history and like how fin Finland has as a country treated them. So it's like, well, it's manipulation of knowledge basically, and it's it's not good. <laughs> Okay, but the question was, how do we do so this would grow? How do we uh, expand this uh, idea that we do want more decolonial design education? Yes. Yeah, that is a really good question. And I think that um, for me, there is, I think there is an interesting overlap between like ecological economics and degrowth economics and decolonization. Uh, or, or at least talking about colonization in a European context, or like um, how to, for example, make Finnish people understand colonialism. Uh, maybe it could be like, maybe, maybe spatial inequality could be used uh, also as a way to talk about colonialistic structures in Finnish uh, planning system, for example, which I think there is a lot overlap in there that I find maybe in somewhat hopeful in this area, but at the same time, <laughs> I don't know, like I feel the same way as uh, Ellen here, that there is a lot of apathy going around, which is, which is sad. Thank you. Yes, you can pass the microphone. Well, I'm, I'm not from Aalto or Helsinki University, but... Um, Me neither. <laughs> thinking about the, the question and perhaps the earlier comment on organizing, then I think it's um, not so relevant if the organizing, organizing is happening inside uh, or outside of an institution, but it requires people who are committed to inviting people, having those discussions and, and continuing thinking together, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, maybe, <clears throat> sorry, one thing, I'm from Switzerland originally, but I'm studying now in the uh, University of Helsinki, and I was thinking, like in Switzerland to me, it strikes me a lot how people don't realize how much the multinationals are involved everywhere, like doing very nasty things in Latin America and Africa, everywhere. And I think that maybe that's also something that like we need to bring constantly back to the like political arena and to like we are in these democracies where we can talk and also decide what is being like talked about in politics. So I think that these these things have to be like mentioned like more often and maybe that's also the case in in Finland with these like paper companies active in Uruguay and everywhere. I think that if people like more people know what is happening, then they they're also more likely to to feel the empathy and then to act. Well, I've been thinking also this for a very long time. And as we mentioned, like decolonization or decolonial thinking is now becoming a trend or a buzzword. And it's more not really a worry, but more of a thought. But how do we preserve the sensitivities of the topic and uh, not let it be another movement of empowerment, so to say? Because I think that's also one of my biggest qualms with being a sustainability student is that a lot of narratives are about empowerment. Um, especially from a social sustainability perspective. So maybe to give an example, as you mentioned, um, there could be companies in global south countries, but okay, now we will employ the poor women to make them give them money or to like bring, um, empower them, and now we're decolonizing them, so they have more agencies. But is it really? So who understands these? And then again, the topic of who has the power and who has the power to like kind of take these narratives forward. And maybe in the future, we see these two-week boot camps on decolonial thinking and everyone is a decolonial thinker then. So, <laughs> <laughs> running thoughts. But yeah, that's what I've been thinking. I mean, I, I think I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm going to reserve this time for a few of my thoughts. Well, with one is enough. One is enough, yes. <laughs> um, I'll build on one thought, which I think uh, she spoke about spatial planning in Finland. And I think I just presented my thesis last week. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and my thesis was about spatial planning in the east of Helsinki. Um, and it talks about the idea of Puhos, which is Finland's oldest mall. And I was basically analyzing restaurants from uh, a multiculturalism point of view and how restaurants add to um, a sense of place in the urban planning, which is typically discounted when projects go under redevelopment, um, at least in Finland. Um, and I was, re I mean, I've done, I've spent my last year researching on this. And what I understand is a lot of Finland's history 
looks up to the Nordic region, where most of the mental maps come from their neighboring countries, which they have been looking up to for a very long time. And then it goes into the metaphysics of like form follows function, even in like the urban planning. And since the immigration policies are so recent in the country, they still haven't developed to an extent where they exactly know what's happening as well. You know, it's almost like they're learning on the way, but they're also making the same mistakes that their neighbors made uh, when their immigration policies uh, were getting put into place. But I think there's a lot of research in the last 10 years, which is great. And I think that's that was my attempt to try and add to that research as well in the last one year. But to just build a bit on the thought of what Pragati was saying, the context that we are in right now is also that I moved from India to Finland for a design education in my master's. And of course, I was studying decolonization to a certain extent when I was back home in India as well. But there is also an aspect of modernism that has got me here, which I have learned in my education in my bachelor's when I was studying there. And I have also been, over the past two years, thinking about what are those aspects that I want to retain while shedding off the aspects that are not important in the process of decolonizing my other thoughts. And I think that is also important to acknowledge because decolonizing cannot be taken as a stance where it becomes an extreme of modernism, but it has to be a conversation or a sense of respect between both where you build together and you don't make the same mistake that modernization made 30, 40 years ago, you know. Thanks a lot for sharing them. Thank you. Um, I'm, I come from uh, Educational Sciences in University of Helsinki, and I think that's also like a, a place <laughs> to maybe start this conversation since, like you said, or like you said about the Sami movie, for example, I think education system is one of the like main colonialization uh, organizations at the moment. In and like it is recognized as being like the best in the world, basically the Finnish school system. And I don't think having like been there for six years now and watching this, what's actually happening there, I don't think they are are aware of at all. Like. Um, that what are they doing? They they think they're doing good things. They really think that um, our system is the best one in the in the world, and they are like kind of manipulating people for this topic. But yeah, I think that's also like a, a place to maybe start the conversation. That um, maybe it's not the best one, and maybe there is like voices, for example, design faculty, and also other kind of more critical University of Helsinki faculties to kind of bring some things. Having raised two kids in Finland, I can um, align with your thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I'm a third integrant of Sur. <laughs> Sorry, I arrived a bit late, but I, I love how the conversation just opened as a, as a panel should be. Um, and I just wanted to say from my point of view and from the part of the conversation I've heard, that it is very hard and like I so much agree with everything also like this apathetic kind of feeling to like these words that come when you talk about decolonization and how some people actually start feeling kind of guilty in a way because then you think that or they think that you're pointing at them like it's your fault but no we're just making you become aware of this and we can make changes now that we're all becoming aware of this and that's why Sur always talk, I mean, I'm getting very excited talking about this, <laughs> but Sud always says about this, like we always talk from a place of love and cariño, like like this place, this place of like, more like Latin love, like aggressive love, but like that's why we put like everything, like okay, we're saying it with love, but we're saying it like because we want change. And we're saying it in a way that like, it's okay that you don't know, but that's why we're showing you. And maybe from this, you can actually take some action into decolonizing yourself, like you say, and like make become aware of like which thoughts actually come from you and which thoughts actually were maybe colonized into yourself. But like, thank you so much for being here. And I'm loving all the comments. Yeah, maybe we can close with your words yes. because I really like that yeah. the Sur Collective close. Yeah. Uh, thank you a lot for coming here today. <laughs> Como siempre, la música del podcast es de Antonio Zimmerman. El diseño de sonido es de Julián Pereira. Este podcast está publicado con licencia creativa común con atribuciones. Esto fue Diseño y Diáspora. Pueden seguirnos en nuestras redes sociales en YouTube, Instagram y LinkedIn y Twitter o visitar nuestra página web diseñoydiaspora.org. No olviden recomendarnos y recomendar nuestros libros. Nos escuchamos en la próxima.